So, of course, this is one of the more intriguing situations in college football. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just took a poll yesterday that we'll update everyone on. We were looking for the most hated man in college football. Uh, we hope there aren't too many people out there taking that literally. But uh, in a sports context, hated person. And uh, after a few hundred votes, uh, Deion Sanders was leading the way at that point. Uh, when you're loved, you're hated and vice versa. So I'm sure he would also be, I believe, the most loved uh, figure in college football. So let's start there. This is a guy, and it was stated by one of our guests this week very well, that aside from the sport, he is the most independently uh, famous person in the sport of college football. Everybody else, it's dependent on their job. Kirby Smart, Nick Saban previously, it's all Deion Sanders. He's already built up the celebrity. So do you think he's been effective in terms of separating celebrity versus what he needs to do to be a full-time head coach there and whether that's workable in the future. Um, I think he hasn't separated it, but I think it's a good thing that he hasn't. Right. I think his celebrity is what helped generate all the buzz when they went three and last year. Um, I think a celebrity is what pe gets people like the rock or offset or like Terrell Owens or all these famous people on campus at Colorado. And when you're a program like Colorado that doesn't have the endless NIL funds, I think you have to use the other resources that you have. And so Deion Sanders being so famous is a resource, whether people want to admit it or not. And so I think it's probably better that he hasn't separated his fame from Colorado because he's generating more attention and more sort of buzz about Colorado. They increased the amount of applicants they received the local economy has boomed ridiculously and colorado gets primetime tv games all the time so i feel like it, he hasn't but i feel like it's a good thing that he hasn't yeah you make a great point there uh it's difficult for them to be relevant uh, in this college football world of course they were 30 years ago and winning a national championship and having a long run of success hmm. but uh, this is a different deal so what else catches people's attention, of course, we've got college football nation not being able to track these teams every day and get the, the granular of what's being worked on. But it's more about, OK, this went viral. This is this is a situation. This was a comment. And then that defines the program. And of course, the latest that I've come across is the comment about here, Shadur, we don't touch him. Here, Travis Hunter, we don't touch him. Uh, we operate like an NFL team. And that seems to be something else that he's selling is that we're bringing the NFL to college football and we're going to run it like a business. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's – I feel like a lot of the times we talk about Deion Sanders, we're reading into a lot of what he does, probably a little too much, which is fine because he's so polarizing. But, yeah, I think it's smart. Um, to talk about Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter like that. Realistically, most teams across college football don't want their quarterbacks getting hit in practice. Um, the only program that I personally know of that sort of allows contact was Utah. Um, they kind of – they'll do like a full contact camp every once in a while. Um, I don't think they're doing it this year actually. But there's really um, – I think it's smart of him to sort of set the set the tone of like, hey – Although we're not in the NFL, we are treating this like we are in the NFL. That is the goal for everyone on the team to make it to the NFL. So I think he's just treating his team like what he knows. Um, he knows pro football. He knows that he wasn't allowed to touch the quarterbacks. He knows that the best players got days off. Like Travis Hunter played the most snaps in college football last year, and he missed three games to, uh, from injury. So you want to treat, keep Travis healthy. You want to keep Shador healthy. And so I think the team – sort of has an understanding of that. Um, I think it just obviously we sort of associate those two players as being his favorites, but they happen to be their best players. And so you want to protect your best players. You want to protect your investments, if you will. And then they obviously have a lot of NFL coaching experience or NFL experience on their coaching staff. Um, they have Warren Sapp out there. They have a few other guys. Robert Livingston spent like a decade in the NFL. He's now the defense coordinator, Pat Shermer. So they sort of know what they're doing um, in terms of, ushering in an NFL culture. And so I don't mind it um, as long as everyone's improving still. And as long as everyone's sort of getting 
the necessary reps. I think everything's fine. Kevin Borba is here to break down some Colorado football for us coming off of four and eight. But of course, that was a three game improvement from the previous season. And you can catch Kevin's work at Athlon Sports and the Locked On Network. So let's get to the football. Shadur Sanders is gains a lot of attention for other things and his connection there with Dion. Uh, of course, his father, but he is one of the most accurate passers in college football and did a remarkable job leading his team considering offensive line woes. And once uh, the flash succumbed to depth issues and offensive line issues and they started to lose games, then people started to focus on, oh, this isn't necessarily a strong football team and a sturdy football team top to bottom. So Dylan Edwards moves to uh, Kansas State. Dallin Hayden, of course, one of the big pickups. Your assessment of the offense and whether they have fortified themselves up front where it counts. Yeah, I think they've more than fortified themselves up front. Um, realistically, that offense line last year was probably the worst in the country. Um, they gave up like 50, I think it's five sacks total. Shador Sanders was sacked like 52 times, if I'm not mistaken. So he was sacked a lot. Um, I think it really limited what they were able to do on offense. They couldn't run the ball. And so you kind of had an offense where everyone knew what was coming and Shador Sanders was still able to throw 27 touchdowns to three interceptions with all three of his interceptions being late in games or sort or tipped. Um, so the new offense line they bring in around, uh, I think it's, they just added a new one yesterday, a new offense lineman yesterday. So I think they have around 12 new offense linemen. Um, a lot of these guys, played and played well at their previous stop and they have an opportunity to sort of um, curate a new offense. Like realistically, they're going to have a new offense with Pat Shermer anyway, but they have an, an opportunity to sort of establish the run. They have an opportunity to um, develop play action passes. And so I think for Shador Sanders and just people in general, like you have to realize he put up those big numbers with a terrible offense line. So if this group can be just average, I'd be a little scared if I was an opposing defense. So, Kevin, can you run down the other uh, offensive weapons and who's yeah. back and, and who's new? Yeah, so at receiver, we obviously have Travis Hunter. Um, he's playing both ways. They bring in a, Vander, or a receiver from Vanderbilt named Will Shepard, who's about six foot three, six foot four. He's massive. Um, even though it was Vanderbilt, he put up some pretty big numbers in the SEC, and he's already someone that has been making some noise over there in Boulder. They have Lejante Wester, who came in from Florida Atlantic, and I think he was first or second in the country in catches. He had over 100 catches last year. He's probably the fastest player, if not on the team, in the country. He's one of the just quickest guys out there. Um, him and Shador Sanders have already built a rapport. He was actually... I'm sure everyone has seen it. He was the receiver in the edited video um, on social media the other day where everyone thought it was two separate clips. Just a weird social media um, sort of risk, I would say, by Colorado, but it wasn't edited. Uh, and then they also have Jimmy Horn returning, who he was electric for them last year as well. So they have a lot of speed, a lot of size. And then they have a few freshmen and underclassmen transfers who haven't played much, but are expected to have some sort of impact. So it's Cordell Russell from TCU. He's like six foot three. He's built. He's ginormous. They have Draylon Miller, who's a four-star recruit in this past class. So they have a lot of weapons all over the place. And then their running back room is pretty stout as well. So Colorado's offense, I imagine, will be one of the more prolific ones in college football. Myself and just about anyone who loves college football got very familiar with their personnel the first four weeks of the season when they were in the spotlight. We were watching every game, and I got to say, I kind of lost track uh, once uh, they got mired in this losing streak. Right. And I should put my phone on silence every time I go to air. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, I have yet to do my deep dive on Colorado. So thanks for stopping by, Kevin. Appreciate you breaking things down. Jackson, thank you so much for dropping Kevin's uh, X account link in the chat. It's right there in the chat. It's down below if you want to copy that and follow Kevin's work at Athlons and Locked On. Uh, the defense, of course, was horrific as well. What are the uh, additions and changes that uh, bring some hope on that side of the ball? Yeah, so similar to the offensive line, they brought in probably what's going to be a completely new defensive line. 
Um, they brought in guys like Dayon Hayes from Pitt, who was a a key player for Pitt. He was a starter, um, Pittsburgh native or Pennsylvania native, and was someone that Pitt was really hoping could help them contend for something this year. And I don't know if everyone's familiar, but he was the the transfer that was like, I'm leaving because I don't think we could contend. And then he ended up transferring to Colorado. So he obviously thinks very highly of Colorado. Um, they have a guy named Chosen Nwankwo from Houston who – He's a defensive tackle that's like 5'11 and 295 pounds-ish. But he's a ball of muscle, um, former high school state champion at re- wrestler, so he's very physical. Uh, they brought in a ton of talent just all over the place. They took a flyer on a couple of former blue chip recruits that really hadn't played. And Quinn Barnes um, started his career at Alabama. He's 6'5", 315 pounds. Quincy Wiggins, another big dude from LSU. And then I liked what they did specifically in the secondary. Um, they brought in a guy named DJ McKinney who started at Oklahoma State this past year um, as a freshman or a retro freshman. Uh, Deion Sanders has already said that he has a first round, um, his first round talents, uh, McKinney does. And so you have him and then you bring in Preston Hodge from Liberty, who is also really good and one of the highest graded corners in all of college football, according to PFF. So you have those two guys and Travis Hunter and – I think the secondary not only is looking a lot better, but you're a lot, you're now able to sort of give Travis a break if need to be um, on defense as well. So they brought in a lot more talent all over the place, and it's really interesting to see how it comes together. Obviously, we haven't really seen them all together uh, because not all of them were there for spring, and even then the spring game is a glorified uh, practice. So week one against North Dakota State will be their biggest test on defense can they stop the run can they get physical last year the answers to both those questions were no Dion probably half joking but he's made comments about uh, North Dakota State not necessarily being the best uh, week one opponent because they're not going to be given much credit for the victory and it's going to be a tough go all you have to do is look at North Dakota State against some pretty good power five programs for the last five to ten years and they always just about always play it close, if not pull off an upset. So that will be a challenge. Yep. Yeah, North Dakota State is one of those programs where they've won, I think it's like nine championships in the past decade or so. They've they've beaten, I, t- I talked about it on my show yesterday, they beat Kansas in 2010. They've beaten Kansas State. They've beaten Minnesota. They beat a top 15 ranked Iowa team. And they're all, they're doing this all on the road. So like they don't care who you are. They don't care where you're where you're from. They will beat you. They will embarrass you. And for Colorado, I look at it as one of two ways, right? You can make a statement. Um, they play them on a Thursday night, so I think it's a standalone game on ESPN. And you have a chance to sort of – everyone is kind of pushing or expecting Colorado to get upset by North Dakota State. So if you beat them, that's a statement win. Now, if you lose, it's obviously a very tough start to your season, and – People will hop on you as as much as they did last year when you were on that losing streak. So you have to sort of get ready right away. It's not like you're playing the Citadel. It's not like you're playing one of these FCS programs where it's like you're going to beat them by 60 and pay them a million dollars. No, this is a team that fully thinks they could beat you, and they probably, if ever, everything goes right for North Dakota State, can beat Colorado. All right, Kevin. Well, hopefully we can catch up sometime before then. And if not, uh, there's that big Nebraska game. Of course, Husker fans are really looking for revenge. And uh, Colorado, uh, I know that uh, Jeff Sims was a turnover machine in that game, and it had much to do with it. But certainly uh, the Buffaloes took it away in the second half and now have to go to Lincoln. And that's a much anticipated primetime game. That's a week two game, correct? Yep. Yeah, Me right too. after the next week. Interesting. Good yeah. stuff. Yep. Kevin, I uh, want to make sure that everybody can find your um, your work. So let us know what you've got available. Yeah, I'm over at Athlon Sports covering a lot of college football. Um, Athlon's taken a little bit of fire lately because of a recent article. Um, I'll just tell you from what I know of going on in Colorado, the whole Grand Theft Auto stuff was um, not – I didn't have the same sentiment shared to me. Um, so we'll just leave it at that. But other than that, I'm covering trending news, all things college football. I'm doing a lot of Olympics coverage right now, um, which has been really fun because you get to learn about new sports, whether it be track, gymnastics. And then I'm also over at Locked on Buffs where I'm covering uh, Colorado and Deion Sanders every single day. Um, we're talking about something. I did my record predictions 
yesterday and um, had a blast doing it. So make sure to go check it out. Kevin, appreciate you being here. Uh, football's almost here. And uh, thank yeah. you so much for breaking down uh, the buffs for us. Yeah, no problem. Have a good one.